uh, the conservative position is that God exists, that uh, we, we answer only to God, and that uh, there shouldn't, the government shouldn't get it between us and God, uh, that, that if we have any needs, we can pray to God, and if there's any benevolent needs in the community, as Christians, we should meet those needs. We shouldn't depend upon a welfare state for security from the cradle to the grave. We should depend upon God, and we should depend upon our own humanitarian acts as Christians. This is the Christian philosophy, and it's also conservatism. Do you see what I mean now? Well, I see that that is conservatism, I guess. What I don't see is uh, why you couldn't believe in God uh, and why you couldn't still believe in the combined intelligence of a group of people, like a nation, voting for certain laws which would guarantee that some people wouldn't die in poverty, live without a doctor, uh, who if they worked all their lives wouldn't have some uh, retirement fund. This is the church's responsibility. We pay our tithes into churches. Uh, these tithes are, uh, originally were not intended to put air conditioning units in churches and make the churches comfortable or build mi multi-million dollar plants for one hour of education on Sunday morning. This money was to be used to help the less fortunate. And the New Testament Christianity said that every man should work. Uh, the Apostle Paul was pretty bold, bold and pretty brutal about this. He says if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. Now that's conservatism in my opinion to the nth degree. He says if a man is capable to work, he should work or he shouldn't eat. Now this was the teachings of the Apostle Paul. And he emphasized the thing again. He said, as I said before, I say it again. If a man uh, uh, doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. In other words, a man is not the responsibility of the church nor society. If there's work to be done, he's physically able to work and he refuses to work. We feel that the welfare state uh, uh, puts a premium on, uh, uh, on, on, on laziness, on slothfulness, and often even on, on lawlessness. Uh, as long as you uh, reward people uh, for uh, bearing illegitimate children, and there's no moral responsibility involved in, in, in these acts, we feel that there's no end to this thing, and ultimately it'll br it will uh, bankrupt the government. We feel that the Christians who have been saved by the gospel of Christ and all people who believe in God, it is their responsibility to take care of their fellow man. Look at the Jewish people. This is a prime example. I've never seen a hungry Jew. I've never seen a Jew begging. I've never, I've never seen a Jew without work. That religion takes care of their people. They don't ask the state for help, they take care of their own. And, and we believe that Christianity is nothing more than a continuation of this Jewish concept uh, uh, with the gospel of Christ uh, the, uh, relating to salvation being added to that concept. So if it's worked for the Jewish people for thousands of years, that they take care of their own, and none of their people ever have to beg, why, why, why can't it work for the Christian people? Why can't it work for a uh, so-called Christian United States where the majority of the people claim to be Christian? We do not think it's the responsibility of the state to take care of our fellow men. We think it's the responsibility of the church. The church ought to be building the orphanages. The church ought to be providing for the aged. Furthermore, the Bible teaches that it's the responsibility of the children to take care of their parents. This is part of New Testament Christianity. That, that I have a responsibility to care for my parents, just as my children have a responsibility to care for me when I become aged. That's New Testament Christianity. But now we, we have abdicated that responsibility. We let the state take care of our parents. And this isn't right. This isn't New Testament Christianity. Well, I guess the feeling is that in a society which has become less traditional than that, than in, in the, the United States society has become less traditional, that the complexities of city life, of urban life, thrust upon the state burdens, which indeed the private churches aren't assuming. The, I agree with you. I agree with you that the, that the responsibility for the mess that we're in today, this, uh, this uh, welfare state which is bankrupting our country, we have a debt that seemingly will never pay off, that the greatest responsibility for this is on the church, the church that refused to accept its responsibility. I agree with that. The church has refused to accept its responsibility, uh, just as uh, individual Christians have refused to accept their responsibility, as I suggested a moment ago, such as caring for their parents and caring for their less fortunate brethren. But I still insist that the perfect society is the one that Jesus Christ laid down, where a man depends upon God, and as long as he's capable, he works and provides for his family. The scripture says, if you don't provide for your family, you're worse than an infidel. That's what the Bible says. The scripture doesn't say uh, that we should let uh, a neighbor care for our family as long as we're physically able to care for our family. The man who doesn't care for his own is worse than an infidel, and, and according to the Bible, according to the teachings of Jesus Christ. The ideal situation is the one that I think we once had in the early days of our republic. When, the, uh, when people worked and they enjoyed working, and they enjoyed the fruits of their labor. And our whole society was built upon uh, this free enterprise, this private competition, the accomplishments thereof. 
This was Christianity. I think the early days of America, uh, mankind came the closest to practicing New Testament Christianity of any people in the history of the world. And we've gotten away from that. Now there is no individual responsibility. And uh, I think it's partly because the church lost its way. The church uh, misappropriated the funds, if you want to say, instead of using the tithes and the offerings to, to fulfill its uh, humanitarian obligations. Uh, they wanted fancier churches and fancier educational plants and so forth, and the money was misappropriated in a sense and used for purposes that were not intended in the scripture. How does this solve, how does this, however, solve the present problems that we have in this country, like bad schools and, uh, and undereducated children, uh, um, segregation in the South so that the Negro doesn't really have equal opportunity, um, the urban slums, how does this philosophy solve those problems? When you give man pride in being an American and pride in being a human being, he's going to better his condition. But the welfare state tells these people, don't worry about yourself, we're gonna take care of you. You're poor because society made you that way. I don't agree to that. I don't believe that the, the poor in New York City are poor because they have to be. I think they're poor because they want to be or they lack the initiative to rise above the poverty class. Uh, Christianity says rise above your condition. Christianity says don't accept the status quo. Christianity says improve your lot. Christianity says work. Christianity speaks of initiative. Christianity speaks of zeal. Christianity speaks of hard work. But men are trying to substitute for work pleasure and leisure, and it can't be done. The welfare state will continue to encourage people not to stand on their own two feet The wealth, because they're giving them the security from the cradle to the grave. They're, they're encouraging the people not to work, not to learn a trade, not to provide for themselves. They're, they're encouraging uh, the uh, minorities especially to just constantly complain about their lot rather than trying to improve it. I read the other day where a, where a, a group of a minority group in a community that claims to be poor, that they had appealed to the United Nations for foreign aid for an American city. How ridiculous can you get? Now you speak of the situation in the South. Let's recall it wasn't Atlanta that was burned down, it was Detroit. Let's recall that your, your great race revolutions in this country have not been in the South. Your great race revolutions have been in the East and in the North. So let, let, let's not get to this place that we just automatically condemn the South uh, whenever we think of segregation or in, uh, racial injustices because apparently uh, they felt there were some causes up here. Now I, I think this, for illustration, let's take uh, the, the race riots, I'm on that subject, like Detroit, and Newark, and these other places. I doubt very sincerely that those things were the results of uh, people being mistreated. I think it was results of people being treated maybe too well by the, by the state. Uh, they, they were told they didn't have to work. They were told they didn't have to provide for their own. They were told that they could get security from the cradle to the grave. And these people wanted more and more and more. We're covetous by nature. We want more and more and more. We see someone with something that we don't have, we covet it. We want it. The Bible warns against covetousness. Christ told us never to covet somebody else's. They worked for it. They, had it. they were entitled to it. They had a right to it. And uh, uh, I would say this. In, instead of, instead of uh, encouraging people to want more and more and encouraging them to, uh, to uh, demand more and more without paying the price of citizenship, we should, should teach uh, the thing that should be done in Detroit and Watts and all these other places where there have been a race riots is set up uh, education, uh, vocational schools and teach them trades. Teach them how to be plumbers. You know what a plumber gets? Fantastic. Yeah, well, the a argument plumber is gets more than don't. a PhD. They ought to put up vocational schools and teach them to be plumbers and electricians and cameramen and, and interviewers and, and preachers and everything else. I mean, these people need to be taught to use their hands but they'll never accept this responsibility until you give them a challenge of initiative, the challenge of the American system, that you don't have to be poor, you don't have to live in slums, you can improve your lot if you wanna have a will to win. If they don't like Detroit, they can move south. If they don't like the south, they can move to Detroit. The this argument is, a free is you country. See, they don't even have the educational opportunities and they are ghetto ghettoized. Oh, they don't cut like it out, ghetto. cut it out. The head of 3M, which is one of the largest industries in the United States, I understand doesn't have a college education. I have a year and a half in college. Maybe it shows in what I'm doing. But I was only able to get one year and a half in college. And yet I have a movement here that has hundreds of thousands of followers. And I had, I had an idea. I had a vision. I believe that God had chosen me to try to awaken the American people concerning the threat of communism internally. And I didn't let the fact that I didn't have a formal education stop me. I went out and did the best I could. My tools were limited. My abilities were few, but I did the best that I could. My father uh, never owned a home. We rented a house. My father was a truck driver and a farmer. And I remember when I graduated from high school, I complained because 
I alone in that class, it was during the Depression, I alone didn't get a, a graduation ring. And I criticized. There was a kid that I knew real well whose father was quite wealthy, he was in insurance business. And I said, why can't I have the money that uh, so-and-so has? Why don't you have the money? Why doesn't the government make his dad give me a graduation ring? My dad grabbed me by the shoulders with his ham-like hands, and he said, boy, this country doesn't owe you anything but an opportunity. And that's been my philosophy in life. God doesn't owe me anything but an opportunity and the counsel and the guidance to make the best of it. And this country doesn't owe me anything but an opportunity. This country doesn't owe anybody anything but an opportunity to get an education if they want it, an opportunity to get a job if they want it, an opportunity to start a business if they want it. But it depends upon initiative and zeal and drive. It depends upon the individual. You've got to instill in every American, minorities and majorities, a desire to get ahead, a desire to use the American system to the fullest extent. Well, how do you do that? Because you, because you're offering me, you're, you're, you're That's what offering I'm doing me a right frontier now. solution. That's what for... I'm doing right now. That's exactly what I'm doing right now. I'm telling the Negro people to quit whining. I'm telling the poor white people to quit whining. Quit whining about injustices, real or imagined. But get out and better your situation. Stand up on your own two feet. Don't wait until somebody comes along and gives you life on a silver platter. Christ teaches us to stand up and live and do our best in life and to reach for the clouds. We need inspiration in America today. Instead of this, uh, this guilt complex, we, we have written off the South. We refer to the South as segregationist South. We've just written them off. Massive guilt complex. Now we're writing off Detroit. Uh, we're writing off all these places that have, have racial disturbances. We don't need a, this negative spirit that's in America. The welfare state, the socialists, the liberals have given the United States, majorities and minorities, a guilt complex. That we're guilty of something that we haven't shared, that we, uh, we've got too much, or that we've done wrong, or we're, we're uh, prejudiced, or, or we are the discriminators, or we're this or that. I'm tired of this guilt You complex. don't think it's true? This is the greatest country in the world, and we have the freest nation in the world, and we've got the, we, we have a, a system of government that'll let any man go as far in life as he wants to go, with or without education, if he but desires to. But it depends upon the individual. Does he have the zeal and the initiative and the challenge and the inspiration under God, or is he dependent upon the Johnson administration, the welfare state for security? Personally, I'm dependent upon God to make my dreams come true. You can depend upon the welfare state if you like to make your dreams come true, but I don't trust the welfare state. So I'm trusting God, I have complete confidence in Him, and I think we've got a future. Well now, what about, the, uh, what, about what you find in the United States as the internal subversion of the country? Do you feel that communism in this country really does have a hold on a major portion of the population and is influential? Is it influential uh, no, no, in government policy? As far policies? as you're saying, are the American people, a majority of the American people communists, this would be ridiculous. The majority of the people of the Soviet Union are not communists. Uh, they claim that uh, less than 15% of the people of Russia are communists. I don't, think, I don't think the communists ever took over a country by free elections, did they? I don't recall a single country they ever took over a free election. It was by revolution or military coup or infiltration. Uh, I, certainly they don't have a majority, numerical majority in the United States. This would be ridiculous. But I will tell you this, they have influence. They had influence in these race riots. Uh, these men, like Stokely Carmichael, who are going to Fidel uh, Castro's Cuba and who are going to Hanoi, to Ho Chi Minh's Hanoi, and allying themselves with international communism, you can call them, if you like, uh, sophisticated intellectuals, but I call them communists. As far as I'm concerned, the black power movement is a red power movement. You do have the communist influence in this country. You find this same motley crew of communists showing up wherever there's a racial revolution, wherever there's a race riot. I, I, something ought to be done to, quite frankly, and I realize that this, uh, the, our liberal friends are horrified at this statement, but since the communists are killing our kids in Vietnam, I think we're perfectly uh, justified in outlawing the Communist Party and its activities in the United States. We, we certainly outlawed Nazism in World War II, and we certainly should outlaw communism in World War III. You know, these communists that are killing our men in Vietnam are communists just like the ones in New York or the ones in Chicago who are dedicated to the same international cause and these same international objectives. Well, but all of the evidence about the Communist Party in the United States that I've read is that the Communist Party is in shambles, that it's an old and aging membership, and every time a member dies, the daily worker loses a subscription. Well, this is whether or not, you, this is really whether or not you would say that the Communist Party and the New Left are the same. Now, you wouldn't say the new left is in shambles. They had quite a pretentious convention in Chicago just recently. 
They followed the Communist Party line from A to Z. They opposed victory over communism in Vietnam or anywhere else. They urged our pulling out of all of these countries that we now have military involvements in to protect these countries from going communist. I think the communists will, uh, will take advantage of any problem in the United States. I didn't say that Detroit was started by the communists, the riots. I didn't say the riots in Cleveland started by the communists, but the communists were there. The government committees have said they were there. They've named them they were there. They were involved. They were certainly throwing, uh, uh, they were trying to fan the fire. This is my point. They'll exploit any problem in the United States for the intent of, of causing a revolution of any kind in the United States for the overthrow of the government ultimately for communism. Now, communism is in the business of exploiting problems. They're in the business of, ex of, uh, of trying to cause dissent. I don't believe the country's in the mess that you think it's in. I think the majority of the Negroes are pretty well happy with America. The majority of the Negroes in this country are Christian. They're fundamentalists, too. There's very little theological liberalism among Negroes in this country. Most of them are theologically conservative. They love Christ. They believe in the Bible. The majority of the American Negroes are fiercely loyal. They're fiercely patriotic, and they're fiercely religious. And I don't think you find the discontent uh, that, that you uh, seem to feel there is among the Negroes, among the rank and file of the Negroes in this country. I think they're quite happy with America, and I think they're willing, for instance, they tell me there are more uh, Negro millionaires in Atlanta, Georgia, than any single city in the United States. Is this true? They say there are 27 Negro millionaires in Atlanta, Georgia. So you can get ahead in the South. Some of them are getting ahead. Uh, uh, Negro conditions can be improved in the South, but they can also be improved in Boston. And, the, and white conditions can be improved in Boston, but they'll be improved when you instill in your fellow man a desire to get ahead. When you instill in him uh, the responsibility of citizenship, and when you inspire him and challenge him to move out above his, uh, beyond his environment. Lincoln moved out above, uh, beyond his environment, and we can produce Lincolns today, you know. Uh, one of the things I'm curious about is you seem to feel that there is, a, there is support amongst the Negro community and indeed in the country at large for the war in Vietnam. The polls, don't, the polls show a gradual disenchantment with the war in Vietnam. No, 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 no. I would question that. This, this, is, a, this, is, a, a very gen, this is a statement of generality, as you've just said, my brother, and, and you're, you're a better man than that. The polls do not show that at all. The polls show a concern over the way the war in Vietnam is being conducted. Listen, there is tremendous resentment against the Johnson handling of the war in Vietnam among conservatives. Uh, Senator Goldwater, no less a figure than Senator Goldwater, said that we ought to win that war in Vietnam and bring those boys home to their wives and children. He said we ought to bomb the supply lines such as Haiphong Harbor. Uh, I think that the majority of the feeling of the United States is against the handling of the war in Vietnam, not our being there, but the handling of the war in Vietnam, there is, a, there is a clamor throughout this nation that we win the war in Vietnam and get this thing over with and come home. Well, what does if we can't mean? whip the Viet, well, let me ask you this. Would you have had to ask that question in World War II in relationship to the Nazis? If I had said we ought to win the war against the Nazis, would you have had to ask me, what do you mean by winning? Why do, you, why do the liberals, I'm not going to say you're a liberal because you're a good interviewer, why do the liberals in this country, uh, why did they demand a victory over Nazism in World War II? And they're willing to compromise and appease with equal uh, a satanic and vitriolic enemies, the communists in World War III. Why did you demand total victory in World War II and you'll be satisfied with anything in World War III? Why? Have we changed our minds about the virtue of victory? Have we changed our minds? about our faith in the superiority of the American system? Have we, lost our, uh, have we lost our American dream and our determination to be independent and free? The I can't imagine a liberal that would have allowed a Nazi organization to exist in the United States in World War II. The argument, but they're perfectly willing to let communists like Gus Hall go on college camps in World War III. This, to me, is incompatible. There's something wrong with that. In terms of Vietnam, most people feel uh, the argument is, most people, the argument is that, that there is a national movement afoot there as well as a communist movement afoot mm -hmm. there, uh, and that there's a question about whether the United States should commit $28 million a year and 500,000 troops to that battle when it seems to people that there's a great deal to be done here at home with that same money. 
You including mean not, communism? Including not taxing conservatives as much. Well, now you're trying to get me on your side by <laughs> saying something friendly. And I'm no. going to fall for that. But let me say this to you. You demanded, all the liberals demanded, all conservatives, every American demanded total victory in World War II. We wanted to stamp out Nazism in the world. Communism has enslaved more people than Hitler ever did. Communism has killed more people than Hitler ever did. And yet we're willing to live and let live with the communists. We are in a war and it's a, it's a, somebody's gonna win in Vietnam. We'll either win or the communists will win. And I cannot understand this attitude that so many people have today that we'll settle with something short of victory in Vietnam. We should not get involved in any war we don't intend to win. We shouldn't go anywhere at any time and start a conflict that we don't intend to win. It's not the American way. There is no substitute for victory. This is, a, this is fundamental Americanism. Well, you see, the argument is that there are many communisms in the world today. That the communism in Yugoslavia is different from the Soviet oh, Union, oh, which is different from communist and China. And you believe that? You don't believe I that. I most certainly do not. I most certainly do not. This, this would be, uh, we would be, we would be questioning the intelligence of our viewers if we were to uh, suggest to them that uh, communism in Yugoslavia is different from communism in the Soviet Union, or that communism in Vietnam is different from communism in Hungary. Communism is communism. It is an international conspiracy against democracies, against republics, against freedom. Communism is our enemy. We will do more. We will do more to discourage the uh, ambitions of the communists of the Soviet Union by winning the war in Vietnam than anything we can do. I read this week, and I, it was put out by some government source, that 83% of the war material that the Viet Cong is using comes from the Soviet Union. So apparently uh, uh, this is not a Mao Zedong war or a Joe and Lai war. In Vietnam, this is a 83% uh, of the war material else coming from the Soviet Union, so they're pretty much involved. All I know is this, that we are in a life and death struggle with international communism. Uh, the communists have been taking over country after country, including Cuba, 90 miles off the shores of the United States. And these nations in turn against us. They enslave their people. Along with the enslavement of people is the unnecessary martyrdom of Christians and re other religious people. The, uh, ins the enslavement of people includes the abolishment of private ownership property. They become mere robots of the state. We don't want that in this country. We believe that America is the greatest nation in the world. We believe that our system of government is the shining example to all the nations of the world. We don't, we don't believe at a time that we're fighting communism in Vietnam that there should be any communist influences at work in the United States. Uh, turning our, 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 our moving our government left, whether it's the new left or the old Communist Party. And uh, uh, we believe that this nation needs a, a unity and patriotism, as we had in World War II. Every American wanted to win, but every American doesn't want to win now. And we, we're not, you know, these boys feel it in Vietnam. I was over in Vietnam. They, there is a, a, a bad morale over there, a shortage of morale. They don't, they read the newspapers that are sent to them about the draft card burners and about the, the anti-Vietnam peace marches. And they read about the Fulbrights and so forth attacking our position in Vietnam. This is a source of discouragement and frustration. These boys in Vietnam today, in a sense, are the most heroic soldiers we ever sent into a foreign battlefield because for the first time in the history of America, we've sent soldiers away that do not have the wholehearted support of the American people. So they not only have to keep their, up their morale to either, to, to, to win a war that they're not allowed to win, but, but to keep up their morale and with this foolish type of war, but at the same time, they've got to ask themselves every day, what's going on at home? And why am I over here if they're not behind me? I say that we ought to unite behind the men in Vietnam, finish the war, come home, and frankly, I think we need a new administration in Washington, D.C. But how are you going to win the war in Vietnam if you can't do it with $28 million a year and 500,000 men? What is the answer? The answer is to, wouldn't you suggest that, uh, that the, the military be relieved from all of these uh, guidelines. Now there are things they can bomb and can't bomb. For instance, they can't bomb the, uh, the supply lines of the Haiphong Harbor. I'm no authority on Vietnam or military affairs. 
I'm talking as just one American citizen. If we can't whip the Viet Cong, what makes you think we'd ever whip the Soviet Union or Red China with 600 million people? Well, the hope if is we that you won't have whip... to, you said. Oh, yes. The hope is you don't have to. And therefore, oh. if we appease and pull out of Vietnam and let South Vietnam go to the communists, that this is going to ensure us that we'll never have to fight Russia and China. Is that what you're saying? Well, what, are, what you are saying, it seems to me, may lead us to an Armageddon in which we will have to rely on a whole new planet to take over the... No, we won't have an Armageddon until the second coming of Christ. You're getting into theology now. That's not my dish of tea.